I'm on this uh, Monday, the uh, second day of March, so you've made it to March, and that means we have made it through the month of February, which I always tell you is a big thing, an obstacle to jump or to hurdle as a uh, sportscaster. So it's March and all it brings, especially now we are a couple of weeks from opening day. We are uh, less than two weeks from the NCAA uh, selection Sunday. We are a couple of weeks from the NCAA tournament. And right around the corner are the playoffs in hockey and basketball and, of course, the Masters. Uh, so a lot. And the Derby. So there's so much still to come as we are now 18 days away from spring. It's been a very mild winter. Um, golf course is opening early. As a matter of fact, a couple that I uh, deal with will be opening up on as early as the 13th of March this year because it's been that mild of winter. So uh, up here, so golf courses will be open before you know it. I'm sure winter will take a bite out of us at some point uh, for a day or so, but uh, uh, it has been a very mild winter. Uh, for those of you who were uh, worried about such things, the stock market bounced back today for a day. I wouldn't go crazy yet, but uh, if you didn't get crazy and throw all, uh, and sell all your stuff out, um, you bounced back today, and uh, that's one of the reasons why you do leave it alone uh, if you're in for the long term. Um, and uh, it did bounce. Now it hasn't come all the way back. It's got a ways to come, but uh, it took a big step, although I'm sure there's going to be a lot more outbreaks of this virus before it's over. Uh, I'm sure that will be the case, and there might be some more. Uh, you, hope it, you hope it just gets arrested here before people start thinking about things because, you know, there's dire stuff you could think about. You could think about the fact that they don't want to put people in stadiums. You don't want to, you know, you want to put people on trains. You want to put people in Penn Station. You want to put people in Mass Square Garden. You don't want to put people in games for the uh, NCAA basketball tournament, uh, baseball. Uh, so, you know, it could get crazy. Uh, so you hope that it gets under control. Uh, before too long, hopefully that hopefully that is the case. Uh, the Dow had the biggest in points. Now that's going to happen now because the market's so much bigger than it used to be. But today, last week you had the biggest one day loss. Today you had the biggest one day gain, almost thirteen hundred points. So that's the other day it lost twelve hundred. Today it got thirteen hundred back. Last week it lost almost, I think thirty five hundred points for the week. So uh, you got a third of that back today. Uh, so it was a good day. Um, just found out. I got a couple things to get to before we get to sports. That uh, James Lipton died. Now, on this show, we've talked about it inside the actor's studio before. I knew James was a big, big, big Nick fan back from the Halcyon days. Back from the days when I used to do the show at Mass Square Garden. Back to the days I'd be around the garden all the time. Um, and he and I became friendly. So I, uh, he used to come to the Nick games all the time. And I used to see him. He he. I used to see him in the stands. I'd see him up in the in the rooms upstairs. Uh, he and I would sit and chat. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I had told him long ago that I was a big fan inside the actor's studio, as many many people were. And his very distinct uh, interviewing style, with his classic cards that he had, and the same questions that he asked each person in the business you know whether you know and uh, how that came together was uh he had a non-credited course that he put together uh in the school of drama the actor studio drama school and it was for writers directors and performers in theater and uh, and film and television, okay. So um, he put it together, and little did anybody know that that thing would last for, you know, twenty five years, and produce some of the great interviews ever, and also be shown in like you know one hundred and twenty five countries around the world to gazillion amounts of people. So uh, it became a I mean, he was parodied on Saturday Night Live. He became one of you know he became as well known as as just about anybody in the business because everybody wanted to do that show and everyone was worried about the classic questions that he'd always asked. You know, he was he used to always talk about how he had been uh, influenced by uh, Bernard Pivot, uh, who was his mentor uh, for asking the questions and you know what what was your favorite curse word. What, you know, what would God say to you when you got to hell? You know, all the same, you know, the whole thing. So 
classic interviews, whether it was the Spielberg one or go back down the line. Yeah, you know, just so many, so many uh, that you can think of that were just unbelievable. Um, and classic interviews with legendary performers. So uh, I'm sure uh, in this day and age, you would expect a, uh, now they were on Bravo. I don't know who controls the rights to those now, but you would expect one of these Netflix types uh, whoever it may be that would have the rights to these to somehow, you know, have them in catalog form because I can't imagine how many times you would go put one on. I know I would. If I had them in, if I had them locked up the way you have these TV shows locked up now on Netflix or any of the other services you have on your TV, uh, if you had this locked up where you could just scroll through and see each one, I'd, I could think of 20 or 30 of them I'd watch again. There's no question about it. So uh, died today at the age of 93 from bladder cancer. Um, so lived a very long life, uh, a uh, gentleman and a, uh, a learned man and a, a, an interesting guy, you know, who started something as an academ academician that turned out to be a just colossal, colossal success inside the actor studio. And uh, became one of the classic, classic interview TV shows of all time. So uh, he is gone at the age of uh, 93. I didn't even realize it was that old, to be honest with you. And I've known him for, I've known him for probably 25 years, maybe longer. And uh, he was a very nice man. So uh, he will be missed, but his shows will live on forever. And like I said, if you if you haven't watched those and you like film and you're into film, or you're a student of film, or you're, you're someone as a young uh, kid who wants to study film, go get these sessions. And most of them were, I would say, 90 minutes. They were really long. There was nothing, I mean, these were extensive expansive, extensive interviews. These were not sure. This went from your childhood to where you grew up, what your father did, what were your early influences, okay? I mean, Spielberg, as you know, if you hear this, see the one with him and think of the movies he's made, he was afraid of everything growing up. He was afraid of, he was afraid of the tree outside his house at night. He was afraid that the furniture would move around on him. I mean, he, was a, he had fears of everything that he turned into his movies. So, I mean, fascinating stuff like that. And you find out some of the origins of, and some of the crazy things that went on with these actors before they became successful. And you realize it's not a straight line to the top. Very, very much. All you have to know, all you have to see to see that, all you have to do is look at Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks, you know, came from a TV show called Bosom Buddies. Okay, he was part of the TV show. But Bosom Buddies even mentioned when he got this big award a couple of weeks ago from one of the awards shows. I don't know which one gave him an award. Someone gave him a state of the art. It was probably Screen Actors Guild. But he mentions Peter Scolari, who was his sidekick and, you know, his, his co-star in that show. So um, just to show you that and he thought he was a great actor and that he didn't have any talent and Scolari had all the talent. And look at Hanks becomes one of the great actors of all time. Just to just show you that, you know, you, you wonder where people come from sometimes, you know. So, uh, or, you know, the, the way George Clooney's come from television. Or, you know, you can take these different people and the, the role, the way their paths go to become these uh, big stars. So it's fascinating, it really is. So he's gone today. A little bit on uh, politics, because tomorrow's Super Tuesday. And if you've been following the uh, Democratic race, uh, it will you'll fill in a lot of the parts tomorrow. I mean, if you look at it as a big puzzle tomorrow, you're going to fill in a lot of the, a lot of the corners because you're going to have one-third of the votes across the nation, one-third of the delegates up for grabs tomorrow. But a lot has happened here. We talked about Biden having to win South Carolina. He won it and won it bigger than anybody could have imagined. The Clyburn recommendation was absolutely... Enormous. Couldn't have won without it. Changed the face of the race. But he won South Carolina so big that it impacted the race enormously. And on top of it, you've now had Mayor Pete step out. Klobuchar just stepped out two hours ago. They're both out, 
and supposedly they will both be in Dallas tonight for a Biden rally where they will both throw their support behind him to unify the t- the party before tomorrow's uh before tomorrow's uh, big, you know, vote across the country on on uh, Super Tuesday. So that is going to be a bit, and there's rumors this evening, and I don't know, I don't know that these are true, and I, I frankly don't think it'll happen, but there are rumors as we lead up to the show this evening that Barack Obama would be there and would throw his support behind Biden. He has not endorsed anybody, but supposedly he was miffed by a commercial run by the uh, Sanders campaign last week. And there's a rumor that, again, this could be just urban legend and it could be something that's gained a lot of support today, but it's not true, that he will be there tonight and will support him. I don't know if that's true. I do not, like I said, it's a rumor. The other two are on their way there. There's a plane ra- leaving South Bend for Buttigieg to throw his support behind them. Klobuchar will be in Dallas. I think Klobuchar could definitely be his his running mate, I think, uh, I don't think Mayor Pete will be, but I think definitely Klobuchar could be Biden's running mate. I think there's a strong possibility. She, uh, Minnesota is a big state. She's a good campaigner. I think uh, she's good at debater. She's has a lot of weight behind her. She's, you know, written a hundred bills in the Senate. She could definitely be his vice president. I think she, that, that, that deal could be a, a very strong one. Uh, Cory Booker could too. That's a possibility. But I think Klobuchar could definitely be his uh, running mate. I think that's a distinct possibility. Um, Elizabeth Warren has stayed in the race. There's no way she's being anybody's uh, vice president. No way. No way. She has stayed in the race. She'll be out of the race in two days. She has no chance. She's got, but she's not getting out. And you know, Bloomy's not getting out. He's not getting out under any circumstances. He thinks he's going to do well tomorrow. He'll do okay. One of the critical things that has to happen tomorrow. Because after tomorrow and where they go, tomorrow's supposed to be Bernie Sanders' day. He's supposed to stretch out to a big lead now. That becomes insurmountable. But if Biden can keep right on his tail tomorrow, the states are going to start to swing Biden's way. And Bernie will get, and Biden will get more and more endorsements as he's done today. Susan Rice endorsed him. Barbara Boxer endorsed him. Reed is endorsing him. I told him about Obama endorsing him. Uh, tonight, Buttigieg and Klobuchar are endorsing him. So he's starting to get a lot of the rank and file behind him. He could still win this. There's no question. He has to raise money. He doesn't have any money. And he won't be on the ground in some of these states tomorrow. So he could struggle. Now, the key is he needs to get 15% in California with Buttigieg and, and Klobuchar out of the race. And Steyer out of the race, he, wouldn't, he probably wouldn't have gotten even a point in California. But uh, they're all out of the race. So you have Bloomberg on the, t- on the ballot tomorrow. You have Warren on the ballot and uh, Biden and Sanders. You'd like to have Warren off the ballot. I don't think the Warren supporters would be automatically Biden. I think they'd be as much Bernie, maybe even more Bernie than they would be Biden. I think the Klobuchar and Buttigieg backers are Biden. They're not Bernie. So that will help. He's got to get 15% because if he doesn't get 15%, he doesn't get any delegates, and Bernie gets them all in California. So he needs to get 15% in California. Supposedly in a poll that was just run this morning, he went from like 10 to 22% in the poll in California uh, in the last two days because of his showing in South Carolina. He also gave probably the speech of his life after after winning in, Ca- in South Carolina. He doesn't give a lot of great speeches. He actually gave a great one on Saturday night. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where we are now. And this is very much starting to look like a Bernie Biden showdown. Um, eventually Bloomberg, who cannot win, who cannot win. He can stay in this. I wondered about a Bloomberg, I wondered about a Biden Bloomberg ticket, but I don't think Bloomberg would want to be a vice president. Even if Biden gave him a big role, I don't think he wants to be a, uh, I don't think he wants to be a, um, a vice, a vice president. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. He, he's not going to be president. Um, he said he's staying in the race the whole way. He also said that he has, and I told you this a couple weeks ago, that all his people on the ground everywhere across the country are all paid through November. 
So the offices will remain open and they will swing, although Bernie Sanders has already said he will not give any of his support, take any support from Bloomberg camp. Bloomberg might not have thrown it his way anyway because they don't like each other and the whole billionaire thing. Biden will take it with both hands. He needs it. So the question is, when does he get it? doesn't sound like he'll get it before the convention, though, from, from Bloomberg. Bloomberg says he's staying in the whole way. Warren sounds like she's staying in, although she has no, she doesn't have a chance at anything. She hasn't done any better than Mayor Pete did. So there's no support for her, absolutely none. She has, no, she has zero chance to do anything, but she's still in the race. So she, she did get to stay in through Super Tuesday. I, I, I would think... See, she had more money than she had more money than Klobuchar had. She had more money than Mayor Pete had, so she was able to stay in for that reason. She also has personal money that she used. She actually took out a loan uh, uh, on her own on her own family money last week to finance part of the campaign. So, uh, or at least set up a line of credit. She had to do that. So, uh, which is legal if it's your money. Um, so she's actually to that extent. So I would think after, after a bad showing tomorrow, she'll get out, and you'll just be left with the three, which will be Bloomy, Biden, and Bernie. Uh, that's probably what you'll be left with after today. But tomorrow's got to be a big day. And the question is, especially California, where Bernie would like to sweep the table, no one else gets 15%, and he gets all the delegates. And that would give him an enormous lead. Biden's got to cut in there and get some delegates and get over 15%. And in a couple of the other states where he hasn't been on the ground at all, he needs, like, he's not doing well in Massachusetts. He's got to go into Massachusetts and at least, at least now, with a shorter group, go in there and hopefully get 15%. And go into all these states and get 15%. And if he can do that and then win the states where he's going to run very well in the South, against Sanders very well. Um, and then the other states later on, he's going to run very well, uh, very strongly against Sanders in every one of them. And I would say right now you're looking at a better than 50-50 chance that we will not have anybody have the uh, magic number before they get to the convention in Milwaukee. So uh, it's probably going to be second ballot stuff. And remember... Second ballot gets kind of crazy because the superdelegates are not linked. The question is, will they leave? That's really the question. And then that's where a Bloomberg thinks he can arrive as the, you know, the uh, alternative candidate. Hey, he can't win. Hey, he can't win. How about me? I can win. And flood the whole thing you know, with his commercials and with whatever he wants to give. Maybe he wants to give each delegate a new car. I mean, whatever he wants. You know, he could do it. I mean, whatever it is. But, hey, the bottom line is, well, he might buy delegates. At that point, he might buy anything. He might buy them all whatever they want. He might bring them in a room and say, what do I, you know, delegate, delegates for sale. Who knows uh, what's legal and what's not. But the point is, he could, he could buy every one of the delegates a car. There's no question he could do it. Not even, not even an issue. I mean, that goes without saying. You know, that you could do that out of petty cash. So, I mean, I'm kidding, of course, but that's how wealthy he is. Um, so it's a big night tomorrow night, very big night. And if Biden comes out of there within hailing distance, only behind like 100 delegates, Bernie's in trouble. Bernie needs to have a big lead after tomorrow, a big, big lead after tomorrow. If he doesn't, things are going to change. They're radically going to change. And Bernie's already starting. We see Bernie's not a, as one person put it, Bernie doesn't play happy warrior very well. He is a whiner. When he's not going, you see, either Bernie's doing well or Bernie's whining. That's what he is. He's a whiner. So when, he, when he's not happy, so now he's starting with the fact that no one wants me to win and the party doesn't want me to win. Well, the party doesn't want him to win because he's not really a Democrat. Just like Bloomberg isn't really a Democrat, he's not really a Democrat. So that's why they don't want him to win the base of the party. The guy who's a real Democrat is Biden. So, and they don't think Bernie can win. They also worry about the House. They worry about the Senate. They worry about the, the state houses. They worry about judges. They worry about all that. And they think with him running, it could be a disaster, which I think they're right about. I do think they're right about that. I'm not saying he won't get the nomination because he very well might. But if he does, it's not going to be pretty. It really isn't. Now, 
you can have something really change it for an incumbent. Right now, an incumbent with a good economy and an incumbent with a very low unemployment rate is almost hard, very, very hard to beat. Uh, even one who has been overall as unpopular as this president has been, he still can be very hard to beat in that way. Does something like this craziness with the virus hurt him? Depends. Let's see what happens. Let's see what it becomes. We don't know what it's going to become. We just don't know how big a story it's going to be this week, next week, the week after, this summer. Who knows? You, just, you know, you're dealing with Mother Nature, who the heck knows? We'll see how it works. It's It has sent a very, very uh, strong market into a state of uh, craziness for the last six or seven sessions, but it did settle down today. We'll see what tomorrow and the next day brings. Even the people who got scared probably by 3 o'clock had started to dip their toe back in and if you had jumped in with both feet this morning, well, you're smiling tonight because you had a very, very big day. But what does that mean for tomorrow? Who knows? We'll do some sports when we come back. couple things on uh, first football. Um, you always hear a lot of noise out of the combines, and clearly there's some impressive athletes every year there now. You see, one thing that you saw this weekend, and you've seen more and more of which shows you, the one thing that has changed so dramatically is the amount of of athleticism that the NFL linemen have now on both sides of the ball, but specifically on defense, has made you make sure that your quarterback now has a level of mobility that he did not have to have in the past. Actually, you might not. The pocket passer as we know him might actually be a thing of the past because of the prowess of the level of the athlete who is rushing the passer. So you now need to put mobility, the ability to move your feet, the ability to escape, the ability to slide and throw, the ability to do those things. No matter how smart, how tough, how gifted a thrower you are, that has become that, that important. 
it has moved, and Mahomes showed you that uncanny ability in the Super Bowl. And I came away from that game, having been there, making the comment that, and I made it coming out, uh, I was walking out of the building that night with my boys and Julio, and I said, guys, if we had a, if Kansas City had a regular quarterback, and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about a regular great quarterback. If they had had Tom Brady, if they had had Peyton Manning, if they had had, you know, Eli Manning, if they had had Dan Marino, they wouldn't have won this game because they would not have, their quarterback would have got sacked 10 times. And that's not a knock on him. He just wouldn't be able to get away from the rush. This kid's ability with his feet made the difference in the game. Yes, we know how he can throw the ball, but his ability with his feet. And you're going to need that now because that's how good these linemen are. And you see the way they run and jump in, pra- in, in, in the combines. You see these monstrous guys run the way they do. It just shows you the level of athleticism, the explosiveness that these guys have now is outrageous. And it makes you have to play the position in a different way where mobility becomes every bit as, like uh, everyone always would tell you, if you talk to guys who actually know the sport, I'm talking about you know winning coaches, top play- people, and they tell you this, accuracy is number one for quarterbacks. Absolutely number one. You can't teach it. You've got to have it. Ac- number one. Now mobility is right there. You've got, and I'm not talking about you have to run down the field like Michael Vick. Okay, what I'm saying is that you have to be able to get away from the rush, slide and throw, slide and buy time, you know, get out, make the first person miss, that kind of mobility. And it's become a requisite as high as accuracy is. That's how important it is now. And you see that more and more with the way these guys are. And this draft is clearly exceedingly deep at wide receiver. You, you'll be able to get a good wide receiver on the third round of this draft. I'm talking about you'll get a starting wide receiver on the third round of this draft. And there's a lot of offensive linemen. Those two things are very obvious. Not a lot of defensive guys, which you know, uh, but a couple. But they're always gobbled up very – If the, the, that that real classic pass rusher, edge rusher, is gobbled up very, very quickly. There are not, almost every one of those is being franchised. The only one I believe is not is Clowney, and that's because Clowney has been on so many teams and he's also been injury prone. And he's known to take – Days off, stuff like that. Clowney's got great talent. We know that he can wreck games. He's wrecked games on numerous occasions, but he's also injured a lot. And he's going to cost you a lot of money. The other thing is everyone's waiting for the domino to drop, and everyone wants to be the first one to say they know where Tom was going to go. No one knows where Tom's going to go because Tom hasn't even talked to the Pats yet, so no one knows where Tom wants to go. And no one knows what's in Tom's heart. So... We don't know that. I'm not pretending I sure don't, and I'm, I don't think anybody does. The other thing is a couple things that are out there that you've heard very strongly. Number one, the rumor that Dalton may be going to the uh, Bears to challenge Trubisky, that's been out there a lot. That should be an easy move for the Bears to get Dalton and bring him in to challenge Trubisky. And Bridgewater to Tampa has been really out there the last three or four days. Very, very strong. That's because Arians made some comments. That's why. Uh, He's been out there very strong. You had, people had thought maybe Rivers, Indianapolis, Tampa for Rivers. Now maybe that pushes him to Indianapolis, uh, Rivers to Indianapolis. We'll have to wait and see where where Rivers winds up. But uh, Bridgewater, to Tampa has been mentioned in a lot. He's going to leave now. There's no question. The question is, uh, real question is, you know, where does Rivers wind up? Obviously, where does Brady wind up? It'll, everyone will kind of fall into place off that. That moves Tannehill, which moves this one, that moves that one, moves this one, moves that one. So there's, you know, it'll, they'll, all, they'll all start to move in place after, after Tom moves, as far as that's concerned. You know, we are we are twenty we're twenty four, twenty five days away from the start of the season. And 
there's a very good chance that the Yankees will start the season without their, without three fourths of their starting outfield. If you count the outfield as being four guys, Gaudy, who's healthy, the ageless one, and then Hicks, who you know is going to be out and is still not going to pick up a ball and throw for another three or four weeks, and Stanton, who is pretty much a foregone conclusion now that he won't be ready for the opener of the season, and now Judge. So if you consider Judge, Stanton, and Hicks your one, two, three, and then Gaudy your fourth, all you have is Gaudy right now of the three outfielders to start the season. So you know Hicks isn't ready. And you have a very good chance that Hicks, Stanton, and Judge are not ready for the start of the season. Couple that with the fact that the Yankees don't have Pax and Severino, and you're already well on your way to another season of major, major injuries impacting this team. Now, a couple things in that. Number one, the injuries were overcome at every turn last year by a remarkable performance of depth uh, and people stepping in and just doing incredible jobs led by Gio Urshela, who now has become a regular based on last year's performance. But here's the thing. This team is very well prepared and very capable of overcoming all that. Last year's team went on to win over 100 games. This team can do the same even with the injuries it has right now. Montgomery's there to help with the pitching. Weisinger's there to help with the pitching. You got a couple of the kids, maybe Garcia, there to help with the pitching. You have Hap. You have Tanaka. Obviously, you have Cole. Um, you have guys ready to step up in the outfield. This opens up a slot for Andujar. It gives Frazier a chance to, if he can basically keep everyone from hating him and you know stay out of trouble, it gives him a chance to show you and, let, and lets his back do the talking. It gives him a chance to impress some people. Andrew Hart, who is a favorite of the organization, you know, and everyone will pull for and give him extra opportunities, another one who could play in the outfield. And you have some guys who have obviously done it in the past and stepped in and done very, very well. So I think they're fine there. And with Cole, obviously, the guy who's ready to anchor the staff, I think Hap and Tanaka will do just fine. I think Hap will have a big season. I think Tanaka will be just fine, and I think Cole will have an enormous season with this team. And this team is better suited to handle that, absolutely better suited to handle that than last year's team was, and last year's team handled it incredibly well. But it is head, stra it is head scratching, really head scratching, how they can continue to just have injury after injury after injury to key person. Why? I have no idea. You know, everyone keeps wanting to know why. I don't know why. And you could say, oh, it's, you know, these, it's these big muscular guys. It's not just them. It really isn't any one guy. They just keep having guys get hurt right and left. Why? I don't know. I have, I have no idea. I mean, everyone has a million reasons. They lift weights too much. They train too long. They don't give their body a break. They train 12 months a year because they don't have to have other jobs or any work or anything. So they, chain, they train way too much. They overtrain. Uh, all these different things. Everyone has a theory. But who knows what's true? And who knows? I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think anybody does. With pitches, you know that there's no issue. You're, taking, you're, you're, you're basically gearing up and throwing a ball very, very hard, very fast. And your body's not made for that. So arms breaking down is as old as the hill, so we know that. As far as the players, why they're so incapable of staying on the field now is a very, very tough thing. There isn't really a reason why. But it continues to happen, and you need depth. You need depth in a, a very big way. I know a lot of people were, I don't want to say shocked, but they seem to be overwhelmed by Romo getting $17 million to do television. Here's what happened. He had leverage. He had two places, and they both badly wanted him. 
So here you had ESPN, which was willing to pay him. The only way, the only way CBS is going anywhere near seventeen million dollars a year is because they know he's got someplace else that will pay him right there. So they had no choice. Now, you hear now these football players make comments about, oh, well, I, I, boy, I could see myself doing that. Oh, really? Just because you play football doesn't mean you're worth one cent in the booth. Romo has, without question, cut through and made himself the biggest and the most unique broadcaster since John Madden revolutionized the business of doing NFL games. And Romo and Madden have something very much in common, and that is they have the right broadcasters with them because one of Madden's greatest strengths was that Pat Summerall gave him all the room he needed to perform. And Nance has done the same thing. First of all, Romo was his idea. It wasn't anybody else's idea. It was his idea. Secondly, he saw something in Romo when he went to those meetings with him that no one else saw. Secondly, he, has, he grew up with Pat Summerall. And he understands what Summerall brought. And he has done the same thing. And realizing he had a unique talent, he gave him the rope and, and, the, and the room to work and to provide something that was different to the broadcast. And Romo's done that. So anybody who begrudges him that money, you know what, just being jealous. He, he's earned every dollar of it. First of all, he has leverage. If he didn't have leverage, he wouldn't have the money. And secondly, he has brought something new to a trade that's been there for a while. He has changed the way these guys do the games. And they're all trying to, to, to do what he does now, but none of them do it like he does. And once in a while, listen, there's solid announcers out there. So it's solid play by uh, color guys out there. Troy Aikman's really good. Does a very good job. He's different than Romo, that's all. Romo has a just unique way of doing it. And it works for him. And it's made him kind of this new cult figure, so it's worked. And they did the right thing. You know what? Football, they pay billions of dollars for the rights to these games. Why would they not pay for an announcer they thought made a difference? Now, it's true. And this puts a distinct cap on what these guys are worth because if you think one person watches the game because of the announcer, you're out of your mind. I, you know that that Monday Night Crew, which is not very good, has driven people crazy for years. They, nobody turns the game off because they're doing the game. Nobody does. Nobody will turn on or off any NFL game because who the announcer is. You're going to watch it. You might not like it as much. You might have a thing for Romo. You might have the Tony Romo fan club. But the bottom line is you're going to watch the game no matter who does it. You're never going to turn the game on or off because of the announcer. You could put two guys off the street on the Super Bowl and it will get the same number. You could make it, I'm telling you, you could take two guys out of Northwestern who are in the school there of broadcasting and put them on the Super Bowl and you'll get the same exact number you would with the guys who do the game this year. Nobody watches the game for that reason. You might like it a little more. In the old days, people always said, you know, I know Giant fans used to go, oh, great, we got sound. On Sunday, when they first hear the voices, they'd be, great, I love that it's Summerall and Madden. That's great. Uh, you know, people want to hear Summerall and Madden. And I'm sure now people say, ah, great, I got Romo today. But they're not going to not watch it because Romo didn't do it. So there is a cap on this. It's subjective what we're talking about, but he does bring something different to the table, that's all. He's broken through. What you try to do in, in any parts of this business is to break through and to be a brand and to be different than everybody else's so that you're not the same.
And remember, there's a lot of people, and they're all taught to do the games the same way. You know, I, I mean, I used to go through this f for years and years because I used to look at all the game tapes when I was a kid. I used to, that's what, what, one of the things I used to do for the network, I used to go through the game tapes. No one knew I did it, but I did it. And, I, I, you know, I've told people, I put reports together of what, what I thought was going on during the games, what I, how they thought they were doing. And that was used by the, you know, producers at the time and, you know, the executive producers, but no one knew I did it. But, um, it's subjective. I might have liked someone's style more than someone else's style. I mean, there's nuts and bolts things that you do right and wrong. We can always talk about what they are. I mean, there's, there's all these things you have to do right and wrong in the broadcast. But my point is, there's also a part where it's subjective, where you might like the sound of someone's voice, or you might like the way he gets in and out of place, or you might not like his style or his sense of humor or whatever it might be. And Romo has created this special niche, but he uh, it's funny... The thing that amazed me was not how the fans reacted, but how the current players reacted to Romo making the money. That was the funniest part. They reacted wildly to them, to him making that money as a broadcaster, making football money to do the games. And I can tell you right now, I know a lot of people were screaming for Peyton Man, you know, been yelling for years for Peyton to do the games. Peyton is great at what he does. When you saw him on that Kobe thing, uh, he did an unbelievable testimonial. You see him in commercials, he's great. You see him up there being himself or doing those vignettes, he's terrific. On the games, he would be ordinary. I'm just telling you, I don't think his style and what he does would be great on the games. I think he'd be okay. I don't think he'd be great. I think he's much better doing what he does now. Being Peyton and doing what he does, I think he's, you know what to expect. You know what you're going to get from him. He's very good at it. I thought that night when he did the testimonial to uh, the NFL, I was watching, it was the night before the Super Bowl. He did the NFL testimonial to on the NFL Network for that their show, award show to Kobe Bryant. I thought he did it. Unbelievable job. You couldn't put anybody up there any time, any place you could have done better. That's, that's a strength. I don't think the games would be as... And I think he knows that. Or I just... I know he doesn't want to do the games, but I think he's smart to stay away because I think the people are expecting so much from him on the games that almost anything would be a disappointment because they're almost expecting him to, you know, do it... They're expecting him to become like Romo became. And Romo just came up with a different way of doing it. He did it like he's quarterbacking the game. He's d he basically put his helmet on, and he decided, I'm going to basically use the keys I know, talking to people on Friday in real time. I am going to look over the field, and I am going to basically do this to the eye of the quarterback. And he's done that, and it's been incredibly successful. And it's a new style, and it's worked. And he's also got a kind of a different personality, and it's worked. So good for him. Congratulations, he's earned it. He did. He, you know what? He took a swing and he hit big. Knocked it out of the park. So many guys fail. We saw Joe Montana step in and do that in last the season. Bill Walsh step in and do that in last the season. So many guys you thought had great personality step in and, and never be successful at it. It's not an easy thing to do to do it really well. It's a, it's a thing that you can do okay, but to do it really well, like no one knew Madden. Madden as a coach, no one realized Madden was going to be like that. Ever. Until they saw those Miller Lite commercials, if you remember those old Miller Lite when he was bursting through. and the, that's the, Madden as a coach was really quiet. Not if you knew him, but if you didn't know him, he was really quiet. I mean, he had a temper on the sideline. He would yell and stuff, but he didn't know that he would be like that. And he obviously, you know, became bigger than life on a broadcast, and people loved him. They liked Romo the same way. Back after this.
You're listening to Mike's On on Radio.com. A couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, the teams at the top as we're two weeks away from Selection Sunday, 13 days to be exact. Kansas has become the number one team. I told you a couple weeks ago I thought that was the case. They clearly have done that. Gonzaga's right there. Um, San Diego State and Baylor were right there. They have very good chances to to get one seeds. They still do. But I think Dayton has thrust themselves right in the middle now, and I, I think they're, especially uh, with what's going on, I think Baylor has uh, uh, at least left themselves open a little bit. Uh, and even San Diego State, where another loss could be the determining ta- factor. But right now, I would put, I would put Baylor, uh, I would put Dayton in the top, in the top four, move them onto the, onto the one line. So I think there's five teams right now that are above the rest. Kansas, Gonzaga, Dayton, Baylor, and San Diego State. From there you get to, you know, surging Kentucky and surging Florida State, which has played very, very well. Um, Florida State's had a heck of a season. But I think right now, and Duke has obviously uh, hit the skids, as we know. But I think right now uh, Kansas is clear number one. Gonzaga, Dayton, Baylor, or San Diego State would be the other. Those are your top four. Uh, so, again, uh, I would move Dayton in, and Dayton could become the first A-10 team to go uh, you know, undefeated in the conference for 18 games. They, that, when, that team has, when that conference has teams that are really good at the top of that league, they usually do very well in the NCAA tournament. Whether you're talking about uh, you know, Temple, UMass, St. Joe's the one year they had the magical season. Uh, so now you say Temple didn't do great. Well, listen, they didn't get to the Final Four. They played that final regional game so many times it was ridiculous. So it wasn't like they didn't win any games. They just couldn't win the fourth one. They'd win three and then lose in the regional. I mean, they must have lost in the regional final like five times, you know, a couple times to Duke, uh, you know, and lost some heartbreakers in those games, not play very well, not shoot very well, uh, especially in the days of Macon. Uh, remember him? Remember Macon? Uh, so, um, but you got a couple of teams coming on now. Florida State obviously is playing very well. Uh, Seton Hall looks to have right, right of the ship a little bit. How about the job St. John's did against Creighton yesterday? Just to show you that you just never know in college basketball for this reason. Teams are so reliant on the three point shot. Creighton is a top three point shooting team. The bigs come out and through it, shoot it. You know what they do, you know how they play. Inside out, the whole thing. Creighton is ranked number ninth in the country on three point proficiency. St. John's comes into the game last night, 307th as far as proficiency through shooting the three, 307th in the country. So, what happens in the game? Creighton can't hit the broad side of a barn with the ball. I mean, they go out and clang every shot all night, shoot 15% from three, while St. John's goes 14 for 22 from three. Now, we all know if you've known St. John's, you know in recent years they can't shoot. And they can defend. They can run up and down the floor. They just can't shoot. And yesterday... They put on a shooting display, and they go on to a big win. And Creighton was playing better than anybody in this league. So you had DePaul get beat. I mean, you had Villanova get beat by Providence, give Providence credit. And you have uh, Creighton get beat by St. John's, and Creighton had been on fire. And last night, they can't put the ball in the ocean from the perimeter, and St. John's comes up with really a insanely good, as good a sh- three-point shooting game as I can, you know, ever remember them to have. I would say this. I, I actually uh, tweeted this out during the game. I was watching it. I said, that is the worst first half I saw Villanova play in maybe a decade. They were awful. They were two for eight from the foul line. 
or two for nine from the foul line in the first half. They couldn't make a three. They couldn't. They couldn't get to. A, they couldn't get to a shot. Uh, they played bad defense in a bunch of spots. They took bad shots. Uh, couldn't make a foul shot. Couldn't make a three point shot. Just awful. Just a dreadful, dreadful game and a big win for Providence. Which that league top to bottom. Providence goes on the road, wins at Villanova. St. John's at the bottom of the league beats Creighton, which is playing better than anybody in the league. Just shows you that league top to bottom is about as strong as a league could be. They might not have a singular great team. And this year, I really believe this, folks. I I think there's one top team. Now, in a one-and-done format, it doesn't mean they're going to win. Because all it takes is a bad five minutes, and you're gone. That's what you're playing here. This is, you know, this isn't four out of seven. If it's four out of seven right now, I'm going to tell you Kansas is going to win a crown this year. But it's not four out of seven. So you have one bad night where the ball doesn't go in the hole, and the other team gets red hot, which you saw exactly yesterday from Creighton, and you wind up going home. But they are right now playing better than everybody else. So they deserve to be not just they, they they deserve to be the team to beat by a fairly substantial margin right now, in my mind. They've gotten better and better. And you got a little bit of a dogfight for that fourth spot now because I think Dayton has wedged its way in there uh, and deserves to be mentioned as pr- prominently as Baylor. I would say uh, Kansas, Gonzaga. But then Dayton, Baylor, and San Diego State are going to have to play their way into this last couple of weeks. It's right there. But, but I'd say right now Dayton has slid themselves into back onto the one line, and they are a legitimately good team. A very – they're all – you know, these teams are all good teams. I mean, Baylor's a nice team. Gonzaga's a nice team. And Kansas is a very, very good team. And – you know, give some teams credit. I mean, Kentucky's playing well right now. Florida State's playing well. Maryland's playing well. So it is wide open, and we're a couple of weeks away. And I saw somebody saying today, well, NCAA tournament's in jeopardy. Nobody knows the NCAA tournament's in jeopardy. Now, come on. Listen, we don't know tomorrow what this thing's going to bring. How are you going to tell me now that you're, you're going to be shutting down NCAA? That's like, that's like saying to me that opening day is in jeopardy. Could it get to a point where we don't want crowds congregating in one place? I guess it's theoretically possible, but we're a long, long, long way from that. So why even go there? But somebody asked, hey, March Madness could be in jeopardy. No, it's not. All right, we'll be joined by the fan right after this.
You're listening to Mike's On on Radio.com. You're listening to Mike's On on Radio.com. Monday night as we head into March. And you know what? Uh, March obviously has a lot to look forward to. It all doesn't happen this early in the month, though. It hasn't been a crazy day today, but there's still plenty to look forward to. You've got selection show right around the corner. Opening day will be this month, too, and then everything else that comes behind it. Uh, you know, this is where, you know, you just shake your head a little bit. I don't I don't know. I, you know, I don't care where the Knicks take – pictures and I don't care how many, you know, old jerseys they throw in the photos or anything else to try to tell you that this is going to be like, the, you know, the halcyon days of uh, Red Holtzman and the Minutemen, okay? But when you see the statements that are made, you just shake your head, you know. Uh, Dolan's statement about Leon Rose, I mean, you wel- we welcome Leon to the New York Knicks as team president. He's the right leader to build a winning organization, okay, no, that's why you hired him, okay, but is one of the most respected executives in professional basketball. The guy's an agent. 
This guy hasn't built any teams. This guy doesn't have a, a, a you know a, a, any, any championships that he's part of. All right, he was LeBron James' agent. That's basically it. Case closed. He's also J.R. Smith's agent among many, many other players. But the point is, he was with LeBron James. That's it. That was what catapulted him to his position. Good for him. Give him credit. Okay? He was smart enough to be able to work his way in to representing and be aligned with the guy who has been the most powerful force in basketball in this generation. If you could get close, it's a, you know, listen, if you were in the golf business and you got close enough to be the next to Tiger Woods, you know what? You were a player. So Leon was close. It was, was smart enough and had his whatever skills he was able to utilize to get himself in position that he was with LeBron James which meant when the league allowed the players to take over the league, which they did, which they did when they all showed up on that. Now, listen, LeBron's way he exited and entered cost him a year nationally. He had to basically apologize for a year for how he did it. It was done with such a heavy hand and so terrible that it actually was the worst thing that could have possibly happened. Because when you're going to make those kind of moves, you just want to make them in a way where you're not going to drive everybody crazy. And with the way that was handled was so bad that people couldn't stand LeBron James. That's not the case anymore. LeBron James has won himself back into people's you know, consciousness and, and hearts in a lot of ways because they've watched what he's done on the court. Okay? I mean, listen. Here's the guy in a league where the player – dominates above all else in certain leagues there are power sources in the nba the power source resides with the players that's it the player dominates michael did it to a lesser extent but in a subtly more subtle way but in a powerful way magic and bird always did it michael did it the player dominates and lebron has done it to the umpteenth degree. They have dominated. Okay, so now the problem is if you want to be critical of this, what you're saying is the thing that catapulted Leon to all his success is not here. It was his relationship with the best player in the world. Give him credit for getting it. Give him credit for managing it, the whole thing, and what he put together after it. No problem with it. I don't even have a problem with an agent taking over the team. But don't tell me about his resume. He doesn't have one. So to stress that, Leon is one of the most respected executives in professional basketball with decades of experience. Huh? He's an agent. This guy didn't build the Spurs over the last 20 years. This guy didn't build the Golden State Warriors. This guy didn't build a championship team. What he did was he was there as LeBron put together that whole Miami deal. That was it. He and Wade and Wade and one of those guys put together that deal, won a couple of titles. They were together four years. They won two titles in the four years. Then LeBron went back to Cleveland, and that's where he got, when he went back to Cleveland, that's when he got back in people's good graces. And then when he was able to bring Cleveland the title, that's when he was catapulted to a level that he now lives at. That's what did it. It wasn't Miami. It wasn't going to Miami, which was a nightmare. It wasn't in Miami, where early on wasn't great. It wasn't even the championships in Miami. It was going home and then taking that bunch and winning. And then even the way he battled in defeat that gained people's respect and changed the way they thought of him. And not everybody's there, but a lot of people are in these older days now. And, and we'll see how th what this year brings. But, hey, Dolan roll the dice. We'll see. He's banking on not the fact that this guy is anyone who's going to put together this great scouting machine 
or put together this incredible and I, and I hope he hires the right coach. I mean, listen, I hope he hires Jeff Van Gundy. I think Jeff would take the job. I know Dolan has no problem with hiring Jeff. I would like to see that happen. I think Jeff's got one more run on him. If it's not, I can think of a list of guys, but I want a proven. If I'm the Knicks, I want a proven. And listen, I am not saying that this guy hasn't done an okay job trying to fight with the Knicks. He has. But you got to figure they're going to go get a big name. And you hope they do. And somebody that gives them some gravitas. And somebody that gives them something that they can build around. Okay? And then they got to go get players. That's what it comes down to. But the oversell of this already, you know, lining up behind a bunch of jerseys that you have no relationship to. I don't know. I don't, I don't get it. There's no relationship to those jerseys. Those jerseys are a long time ago. And the fact that there's more than a couple of jerseys there, okay, I understand. But, you know, the ones you always see, the ones you notice, and everyone notices Dick McGuire because of what he was, but, you know, you notice 10, you notice 12, you notice 15, you notice 19, you notice 22, and you notice 24. And you don't take anything away from what 33 did. I know we didn't win a championship, but they never got him that player. You know, and Dave Check had said to me, once I was sitting with Dave and I said, Dave, all these years here, what's your, do you have one regret? I thought he might say, you know what, I could have patched it up with Riles. I maybe could have handled it a little differently. He said, I really regret that I never got Patrick that second player. And let's be honest, they got him okay guys. They never got him the guy that guy that could have made the difference and made Patrick A. And listen, they should have won game six. I'm telling you, I've said it a million times to you, that if Oak, and Oak we know is now remembered for something far different, but what I'll remember Oak for is, and Oak was a really solid player, a tough guy too, but I remember him grabbing that rebound and being such in a rush, thrown at the length of the floor, and out of bounds with a one-point lead. And if he had just taken that ball down and given it to the guard, I, I really think they would have won the game. And I never forget that, you know, because everyone looks to different things in that game, and I look to that. And then that game six, and the other thing I think about in that series, and it never leaves me, because, you know, I always think about what would have happened if they, how everything would have been different if they had won that championship against the Rockets. Different for Ewing, Different for Riley, different for Ewing. Game three, Sam Cassell. Remember, they win game four, win game five. Game three, well, Houston never even gets back to Houston, and that's a five-game final. Game three, Sam Cassell, uh, that, and he was a tough little son of a gun. You know, I always think of Sam Cassell always being one of those guys who, you know, when you needed a shot, Hardaway the same way. But Cassell just would, was a pain in the neck, really a pain in the neck. And that series, if you remember, nobody could put the ball in the basket on either side. You go look at the shooting percentages in that series, they were dreadful. They were absolutely, the bigs were dreadful, you know, all the way down the line, they were dreadful. It was tough to score. It was tough to score in our league at that time because the defenses were really tough. Not like now. I mean, they used to beat each other up, really beat each other up. But it was fun basketball. It really was. But I think back to that and how things would have changed, how one championship, how one ball bounced in the right way in the right game, whether it was game three or game six, Winning that title, what it would have meant to Ewing, what it would have meant to the front office, what it would have meant to the franchise, what it would have meant to Riley, what it would have meant to check it. You know, you, you think about all that. But it's been a long time. And, you know, that team that we always think about with the Knicks, that won two championships playing, whether it was playing the Celtics or playing the Great Bullets or playing the Celtics or playing the Lakers in those days in all those classic series, that cerebral, tough team 
that, you know, did it in different ways. You know, with the Minutemen and obviously with Fraser's prowess and what Reed's guts and what the brush have brought, Bradley's game. I mean, they're just all the different things. I mean, Kazi off the bench. I mean, go down the line. Or what they got from the second group, whether, you know, for the second title, you know, and the changes they made there and what Lucas brought as an example and all the different guys. Uh, you know, you, you think about those days and you realize that they're now so, I mean, they're 50 years ago. Hard to fathom for the Jets. I was thinking about that watching that Larry David thing last night. You know, Larry David, I'm sure you saw it, or a lot of you saw it last night, where the Jets were a major reference point in, in the uh, saga. It's been 50 years, 50 long years. And for the Knicks, as they start again, and start again with the promise of what they're going to bring and what's going to change and how this is going to be it and how it's a critical time. A critical time. Okay. A critical time for the Knicks. There have been a lot of critical times. None of them have worked out. We'll see what this is. We'll see what this brings. They've tried it a lot of different ways. They tried it the right way, the wrong way, and everything in between. Now let's see if it works this way. I'm not saying it won't because you never know. But, you know... You're putting it in a very different way. And you're now saying, hey, it's about players, so let me go get the guy who is connected to the players and see if we can build it this way. We haven't been able to build it any other way. Back after this. Listening to Mike's On on Radio.com.
uh, second day of March, uh, Super Tuesday tomorrow, if you are into the uh, politics of the nation right now. So a pivotal day there, and uh, as we will see what will set up for November, a big part of that will uh, come into play tomorrow after we hear from uh, states far and wide across the uh, nation, including uh, the craziness of California. So all that comes into play tomorrow, and uh, we'll learn a little bit more about what's going on. You already had a couple of people. So then there were four. Stir was gone if you considered him in for a second. I might squeeze a couple of calls in, so we'll, if you want, jump aboard right now if you haven't already. We'll maybe squeeze a couple of calls in before we say goodbye this evening. Uh, we will try to do that. Um, we got a couple of weeks. You you know, you're a week away. You got a week left. After St. John's win yesterday, give St. John's credit for that. What a shooting performance. I can't think of a day they shot the ball any better than they did against Creighton. And Creighton came in playing great. I mean, they really came in playing uh, as good a ball, probably better ball than anybody in the Big East. They had been red hot. They're a team that can shoot. Their bigs can shoot. Everybody can shoot. They couldn't put the ball in the ocean yesterday. And St. John's comes up with a game like that, 14 to 22 from three. And if St. John's going to shoot like that, they're going to beat anybody. Okay, I mean, because you know that you know what you know they're going to turn people over. You know they can be athletic. You know what they can do. They have trouble shooting the ball. They have trouble scoring, especially from the perimeter. And they go up with a great performance yesterday, and that shows you this league from top to bottom. I mean, it just shows you, you know, where this league is, top to bottom, as wide open as a league could be. You know that. Now, do I think that St. Joe's could run the table and you know win the conference tournament next week? Not easy because, you know, anybody can win any one of these games. So to, 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 win, to win anyone, you know, to be able to, to run the table and win all of them, not have any margin of error is very hard because there's not an easy game in a group. Really, there is not an easy ge- – there really is not an easy game in the league, which is, you know, when you look at some of the results. I mean, look at the way Providence played Nova this week as an example. All right. I mean, there, there's not an easy game. DePaul's dangerous. Uh, Georgetown's dangerous. Then you get into the Xavier's and the Butler's of the world and what they bring to the dance. So, I mean, any way you look at it, it is just a league top to bottom that is as balanced, really as balanced as any league could be. I don't think there's a great team in the league. Uh, you know, I don't think this is a – I don't think it's a vintage – don't think it's a vintage uh, Nova team. I can see on their best day that Seton Hall is uh, can be the best team in the league. I can see that. But you know what? Not automatically and not every day. And they need, obviously, you know, uh, to make sure that their big score is a good, you know, uh, that they get the kind of guard play that they expect and maybe even – you know, he's been a little upset with some of his guys and maybe have to whittle that rotation down. One of the big problems for Villanova is they just don't get the guard play you're used to seeing them get. Gillespie's been on a bad leg. He has shot terribly the last four or five games. And, frankly, if Bay doesn't just light it up, I, they're just not great. I mean, listen, they could have a very short stay this year. Now, if they're on their game, you know they can be dangerous. But, I mean, Providence, you know, they shoot 5 for 30 and lose the Providence game. And not only that, they were a 77% free throw shooting team that went 2 for 9 in the first half from the foul line. All right, let me squeeze a couple of calls in here as before we say goodbye. Tom in Oakdale, what's up, Tom? Mike, how you doing? Good, real quick, what's happening? Um, Sure, no, yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, I heard John Heyman talking uh, last week about you know a Mets sale possibly happening sooner rather than later. Okay. I hear Dolan's name being Dolan being will not buy there. the baseball team. I could tell you that right now. He okay. doesn't. He doesn't want it. He does not want. It. He well, wants the. News. He wants the network. He desperately, okay, he yeah. desperately wants SNY. Dolan told me a couple of years ago that he would never buy a baseball team because he did not want his summers tied up with baseball, that he feels as an owner he needs to go to the games, and he doesn't want to watch his team play in the summer. He wants to travel, he, so he doesn't want to ever own a baseball team, but he wants the network desperately. Okay, fair so enough. I, I would mean, be shocked. I will be shocked if Dolan buys the baseball team. Absolutely stunned. Had, 
Have you heard any other rumblings of who potentially could, if Cohen's coming back? I hear Cohen's like not. I've heard Cohen wasn't out. I told everyone that. I don't have any other names for you. I have not heard any name. I told you the A-Rod thing wasn't real, okay? Uh, he doesn't have enough money. I mean, he needs to bring in a right. – got to have a billionaire in a deal, okay? Uh, I don't have any name for you. I just would be – I know I heard the Dolan rumors. I don't believe them for a second. He wants the network in the worst way. He wants to put a baseball network – he wants baseball on MSG Network. So he wants SNY or yes. I don't know if he could get his hands on yes now. I think he would buy the network in two seconds. I don't think – I know he – listen, he told me that uh, two or three years ago when we were still talking, whenever it was, he told me I will never buy a baseball team because I don't want to be locked up in the summertime going to games. So uh, unless that's dramatically changed, and I don't think it is, I don't think he buys the team. But I do know he wants the network in the worst way. So I don't have a name for you. I'll try to find one, but I don't have one. But I wouldn't think Cohn was out of it. Ryan in Bronxville, what's up, Ryan? Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. I really appreciate you talking about Knicks basketball. I want to say that Charles Smith was found three times about 28 years ago. Huh. And I, I think that changes the landscape of basketball. Well, you know Jordan what? That, that, listen, that, listen. Charles, well, Charles, well. Charles, Charles was soft in that play. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, I, I, Come on, oh, listen. No, Go, no, uh, no, yes, man, I was. I was. We win that championship. Uh, no, no. Listen, listen, listen. You got. Yeah. You know what? There were too many opportunities. Forget beating the Bulls. You're going back to ancient history. Go back to uh, the Houston series and Game Three and Game Six. They should win both games, and they don't. They never. They never should have gone back. Out of the league, though. I want Jordan in the league to win the championship, and we win that series. Uh, that uh, yeah, listen, yeah, yeah, no, you like, can't. You can't. Thanks for the call. But you can't bring it back to Charles Smith getting blocked on uh, you know three straight times. That, that being the difference in the whole series. That's not fair. That is a great Nick team, though. That was their best team. Uh, this is Timmy. Is it Timmy in Seaford? I can't read his writing. Is it Timmy? Uh, how you doing, Mike? Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Go ahead, Tim. Jimmy. What's up? How you doing, Mike? Good. Mission to the time hour, brother. All right. Quick two things for you before, uh, you know, you head go off. Ahead, uh, go ahead. How do you feel about the Yankees and Mets possibly coming to uh, an agreement with uh, Stephen Mack? And uh, also, you know, the Yankees, pretty much the whole outfield is done. And not for nothing, Mike. You know. Goldberg just came back to the WWF, so... Oh, that's fine. And you, you were going to wait around. Thanks for the call until you said something stupid. I knew that. Um, as far as Mats, Mets shouldn't give up on Mats. You know what? You can't have too many starting pitches. If Mats has to battle for a spot in a rotation, good. Let him battle. If Mats has to spend some time coming out of the bullpen, fine. Let him come out of the bullpen. You need to have seven starting pitchers. Now, I understand they can use other guys in the starting role if they want to, especially Lugo. But you know what? You need a Mats on the team. The Yanks will have guys. The, you know what? Montgomery can be fine for them. Loisega could be fine for them. Armand's going to come back at some point. Paxton's going to come back at some point. Garcia might be ready to pitch some in the major leagues this year. And they can find journeymen who can give them four or five innings a night and get them into that bullpen and beat nine teams out of ten in the regular season. Where you're going to miss Severino is in the postseason, where you need a quality pitcher going to the mound to win a championship every night. That's where you'll miss him. You won't miss him playing the Tigers. You won't miss him playing the uh, Orioles or playing really all but about two or three teams. You won't miss them any of those nights. The Yankees are going to win those games. They're going to win them in the bullpen. They're going to win them with their lineup. They're going to score plenty of runs. So from that standpoint, that won't ever be an issue. Uh, Where you're going to miss a guy like Severino is clearly you are going to miss him in the big series, at the end of a big series, or in a big series where you need a starting pitcher or you need a star pitcher. That's where you're going to miss him. Uh, in a big way, but I don't think it'll affect the regular season at all. They have plenty of guys who can go out there and give them five innings. They can use the opener when they have to. They can do that. They've proven they can do that. The bullpen's very deep. The lineup's even deeper than that, so that won't be an issue at all. Uh, Casamigos Tequila, as always, brings you the program, brought to you by those who drink it. Remember, Try to represent them on the rocks. You won't be sorry that you did. But any of the Casamiga uh, tequila products are worthy of uh, your uh, perusal because they have nothing but great products, and we thank them for their patronage. We will see you tomorrow. Enjoy your Monday night, everybody.